In the heart of the Australian outback lies a land of shimmering mirages and extreme contrasts. Lake Eyre, the continent's largest salt lake, is a place where the very geography seems to oscillate between two identities. For years at a time it is a blinding white salt flat, dry and silent, the lake bed baked hard by the sun. The surface, encrusted with glittering salt crystals, can appear almost like a vast snowy plain in the middle of the desert. This is when Lake Eyre embodies utter stillness. A dry salty pan that stretches to the horizon. Yet on rare occasions this desert basin undergoes a dramatic transformation. After exceptional rains, water pours in from faraway rivers and Lake Eyre becomes an immense inland sea. Shallow floodwaters spread across the flats, turning the salt crust into a glassy expanse reflecting the sky. What was recently a lifeless playa erupts with colour and life. Pink algae bloom in the briny water. Migratory birds flock by the tens of thousands and fish carried from distant channels spawn in ephemeral abundance. This boom and bust cycle is the essence of Lake Eyre's story. It is a lake that is usually not a lake at all, but when it awakens, it offers a glimpse of an ancient inland ocean returned. Geologically speaking, Lake Eyre sits in a structural depression, essentially a giant bowl in the Earth's crust. The lake's basin, part of the larger Lake Eyre basin, spans about 1.2 million square kilometres, which is almost one-sixth of all Australia. None of the rivers in this vast region reach the sea, instead they all drain inward, converging in the rare wet years toward Lake Eyre at the lowest point. This endoric or internal drainage system is one of the largest in the world, but how did such a basin form? The origins trace back to the breakup of Gondwana and the subsequent drifting of the Australian Plate. During the late Mesozoic and early Cenozoic, 100 to 34 million years ago, as Australia moved and its eastern side was uplifted, other areas sagged in compensation. The Lake Eyre Basin began to subside millions of years ago, likely in the late Paleocene, 56 million years ago, due to tectonic forces pulling across downward. Over long periods this downwarp collected sediments eroded from surrounding highlands, building up a deep filling of sand, silt and clay in what was effectively a broad shallow bowl. By the Neogene period, 23 million years ago, the basin had taken shape as a vast lowland. Climate then completed a job. As Australia's interior became more arid, especially in the last few million years, no permanent rivers remained to breach the basin's rim. Lake Eyre was left isolated, a terminal basin where water can flow in but never out. The lake's existence is thus tied to both tectonics and climate, a depression formed by Earth's crust, situated in the driest part of a dry continent where evaporation far exceeds rainfall. Lake Eyre's defining characteristics make it geologically unique in Australia. It is the lowest natural point on the continent, lying approximately 15 metres below sea level at its deepest floor. If one could dig a channel to the ocean, the Great Australian Bight would come rushing inland to fill it. But natural barriers and distance keep air isolated, and so it functions like a gigantic evaporation pan. The lake's extent is enormous. When fully flooded, a very rare event, it can cover up to 9,500 square kilometres, roughly the size of a small country. In those moments it is Australia's largest lake by far, briefly transforming the desert into a watery mirror. However, full inundation has happened only a handful of times in recorded history. More commonly, every few years heavy rains up north send pulses of water down the web of rivers, the Cooper Creek, Diamantina and Warburton into Lake Eyre's two lobes. These partial floods might fill a quarter or half of the lake, then evaporate away over months. In dry years, the lake bed may remain wholly parched, its surface a hard mosaic of clay and salt. It's said that Lake Eyre is dry about 75% of the time, partially wet about 25% and full very rarely. This extreme variability is one of its most striking features. It exemplifies an ephemeral lake environment on a grand scale, alternately desiccated and drowning depending on Australia's fickle climate. When Lake Eyre does flood, the event is nothing short of miraculous in the desert. Water can take months to arrive, travelling down from tropical Queensland in slow moving channel flows that creep across the flat outback. As the floodwaters spread into the lake's shallow basin, the average depth when full is only a few metres, they create a scene of colours and patterns visible even from space. The lake's famous pink hue often appears at the fringes, caused by halophilic microorganisms and red algae that thrive in hypersaline brine. Meanwhile the influx of fresh water and nutrients triggers a biological frenzy. Dormant brine shrimp eggs hatch by the billions when wetted. Tiny fish stranded in waterholes elsewhere ride in on the flows and multiply in the lake. 
Aquatic plants spring up in wet sediments. Most spectacularly, birds sense the flooding from afar and converge en masse. Flocks of pelicans, black swans, gulls, banded stilts and dozens of other species arrive to feed and breed on the temporary abundance. For a few precious months, Lake Eyre becomes an oasis, a kaleidoscope of life where just previously there was none. The shoreline, normally a crusty desert, might have green vegetation sprouting after rains, and the air echoes with bird calls. It's a boom time that will vanish as the relentless sun evaporates the water away. As water levels drop, salinity in the shrinking lake skyrockets. The lake often ends up saltier than the sea, becoming hypersaline as it dries. Gleaming salt crystals then precipitate out on the surface, refreshing the blinding white crust and starting the cycle anew. Beyond its contemporary cycles, Lake Eyre holds clues to a longer geological saga. During past climate epochs, particularly around 120 to 100,000 years ago, in a wetter phase of the Pleistocene, Lake Eyre was permanently filled and much larger than today. Researchers believe it may have been up to 10 times its current size, forming a massive continuous lake, sometimes referred to as the Great Lake Eyre, which sustained lush wetlands. We know from fossil evidence that this verdant oasis hosted an array of megafauna. Giant wombats, or diprotodons, enormous kangaroos and marsupial lions drank from its shores. Surrounding it were forests and grasslands, a far cry from the sparse salt bush and dune fields of the modern vista. As the Pleistocene ended and the climate grew more arid, the Great Lake shrank and these giant animals vanished, leaving Lake Eyre as an evaporating remnant of a greener time. The lake sediments preserve this history. Core samples show layers of fine mud and salt from wet phases, interspersed with windblown sand from drought epochs, effectively recording the flip-flops of climate over tens of millennia. Even the beaches and strand lines around the basin, subtle ridges marking past high water marks, tell of lakeshores long receded. In a sense, Lake Eyre is Australia's geological memory of an inland sea, come and gone. Today, standing on the crusted expanse of Lake Eyre's floor, the ground underfoot glitters and crunches with salt. The immensity of the flat, open space gives the unsettling impression of being at sea, yet there's not a drop of water to be found. On the rare occasion when water inundates it, that same spot would be under several metres of brine, with waves lapping nearby. This rise and fall of an inland lake, entirely at the mercy of distant rains, makes Lake Eyre's geological narrative uniquely dramatic. It is a basin that lies below sea level, and yet is dry. A place where you can walk on the bottom of a lake and be standing at the lowest point on the continent. In the long run, Lake Eyre may one day fill more regularly if climates shift or dry out entirely if Australia becomes even more parched. For now, its changing surface, from salt encrusted desert to glistening flood water and back again, provides one of nature's greatest spectacles. I hope you found this as interesting as I did. And as always, thanks for watching. Before I end this video, I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreon and YouTube members. Thank you so much to everyone that helps to support this channel.